Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Meredith Malone. I'm the Associate Curator at the Kemper Art Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to introduce this evening's distinguished speaker, Michael Taylor. Since August 2015, Michael has held the position of Chief Curator and Deputy Director for Art and Education at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. He's a leading expert on modern contemporary art and a scholar of Dada and Surrealism with a focus on the work and ideas of Marcel Duchamp. Last spring, the Kemper uh, was able to acquire an example of one of Duchamp's boîtes en valise, or his box in a valise from the B series which is currently on view um, on the permanent collection in the second floor in the museum. So if you haven't had a chance, it'll be on view um, throughout this semester. So I highly encourage you to go take a look. This um, was a major acquisition for the museum and one we are very proud of. And it's on the occasion of this purchase that we've invited Michael to speak here tonight. In this evening's lecture, he will discuss Duchamp's Boite en Belize in terms of its history and reception, as well as its important legacy for artists working today. A native of London, England, Michael received his Master of Arts degrees in art history from both the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and the Courtauld Institute of Art in London. He also received his PhD at the Courtauld Institute before joining the Philadelphia Museum of Art as Assistant Curator of Modern Art in 1997. In 2001, he was promoted to the Associate Curator and in 2004, he was named the Muriel and Philip Berman Curator of Modern Art and head of the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art. During his tenure at the PMA, he organized a very impressive series of critically acclaimed um, special exhibitions. And I'll just name a few here tonight, including Dorothea Tanning, Birthday and Beyond from 2002, Giorgio de Chirico and the Myth of Ariadne from 2003, Salvador Dali, The Centennial Retrospective from 2004, Marcel Duchamp, Etant Donné in 2009, Arsio Gorky, A Retrospective, 2009, and Paris Through the Window, Marc Chagall and his Circle from 2011. Michael's exhibition catalog for the 2009 exhibition, Marcel Duchamp, Etant Donné, won both the prestigious George Whittenborn Prize and First Prize for Best Museum Permanent Collection Catalog by the American Association of Art Museum Curators. Also in 2009, he was co-commissioner with Carlos Buswaldo for the Bruce Nauman exhibition at the American Pavilion for the 53rd Venice Biennial, and that exhibition won the Golden Lion Award for Best National Pavilion. In 2011, Michael was a fellow at the Center for Curatorial Leadership in New York City, and in June of that year, he was appointed as director and chief executive officer of the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth. Under his leadership there, the museum presented a series of ambitious exhibitions that included Man of Fire, Jose Clemente Orozco and Jackson Pollock, and Picasso, the Villard Suite from 2013, and In Residence, Contemporary Artists at Dartmouth from 2014. And it's been a real pleasure to have Michael here uh, in St. Louis today. And uh, without further ado, I'd ask to, uh, you to all join me in welcoming him. So. neglected to say was that I was also an adjunct professor at Penn during my 15 years at, in Philadelphia and she took a Duchamp seminar class with me. She was a great student. So. <laughs> Marcel Duchamp described his Bois en Valise as a portable museum that would allow him to carry around his life's work in a traveling suitcase. The artist spent six years between 1935 and 1941 recreating his oeuvre in miniature using an elaborate and at that time virtually obsolete technique known as pochoir, which allows the colors to be pre precisely applied to multiple impressions of the same black and white reproduction by means of stencils. These chromatically precise facsimiles of the artist's early paintings and drawings as well as diminutive models of three of his ready-mades, Edda Perry, Traveler's Folding Item, and Fountain. You can, this is work, but you can kind of see that strip up there, of the three objects. Provided the source material for the first edition of the work, which was issued in 1941 in a series of 20 deluxe boxes. The works in the deluxe series consist of a plywood box fitted inside a leather-covered suitcase or valise with a carrying handle. 
Duchamp commissioned a joiner in Paris to create the wooden components using his own designs. I have an image there of the drawing for it. Including the guide rails for the two sliding pullouts and the wooden strips which make up the monogram M for Marcel. Each box in the deluxe edition also contained an original work of art mounted on the inside of the lid. So here you can see some uh, drawings for chess pieces. And then here are a, a much more important work. This is um, a work that he gave to his friends, Henri and Alain Oppenau, in 1949. And it's a drawing called Reflexion en main, or hand reflection, which was one of his first designs for the Eton Denet piece. The artist would spend the rest of his life assembling six further editions, each slightly different from the other, which make up the standard edition of 300 boxes that were periodically distributed in small batches during the last three decades of his life. Eventually, Duchamp grew tired of the repetitive and time-consuming nature of the project and hired assistants to help him complete the set. These assistants included Xenia Cage, the wife of John Cage, and a wonderful collage artist in her own right, as well as Joseph Cornell, who would later become famous for his own box constructions. Cornell's boxes often include references to the work of his friend and mentor, as seen in the discs found in the Woodpecker Habitat series that recycled materials Duchamp had discarded from his earlier experiments with rotating discs. In March 1935, Duchamp informed his friend and patron, Catherine Dreyer, that he was, quote, going to make a play toy made from discs and spirals. The designs will be printed in heavy paper and collected in a round box. I hope to sell each box for 15 francs. Through Dreyer's intervention, Macy's showed an interest in selling these play toys in their flagship New York department store, but nothing ever came of it and Duchamp subsequently threw the discs in the trash in the early 1940s, only for Cornell to retrieve them and incorporate them in his own box constructions later that decade. The Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum of Washington University in St. Louis recently acquired a work from the second non-deluxe edition of the Guayan Valise, known to scholars as Series B, which Duchamp completed in New York somewhere between 1942 and 1954. And I invite you all to see this extraordinary artwork in the permanent collection galleries after this talk. While the earlier deluxe versions were housed in a leather-covered valise the size of a large attaché case, the Series B edition of the modern valise was issued in a simple cardboard box and assembled with the help of Joseph Cornell and in some instances Xenia Cage although their precise role in the production of these portable museums remains something of a mystery. The work contains the 68 standard reproductions, all of which have been meticulously colour-proof to meet Duchamp's exacting standards. It seems clear from his correspondence that Duchamp's original attention, intention in the Bonnet Police project was to create something akin to a catalogue raisonné, with colour reproductions and explanatory text. On March 5, 1935, just a few months after publishing the Green Box Notes, Duchamp told Catherine Dreyer that he was considering making, quote, an album of approximately all the things I have ever produced, end quote. The fact that Duchamp was planning a catalogue reasoning of his work in the mid-1930s is surprising, given his non-conformist Dardai's beliefs, as well as his notoriously meager out artistic output. Even his long-term friend and patron, Walter Arensberg, who prided himself on understanding even the most esoteric of the artist's works, was perplexed by the autobiographical nature of the Boy in Valise, while also recognizing the uniqueness of the project. It has been difficult to know exactly what to say of such an epitome of a life's work, he wrote to Duchamp on May 21st, 1943. You have invented a new kind of autobiography. It is a kind of autobiography in a performance of marionettes. You have become the puppeteer of your past. I love that phrase, the puppeteer of your past. Unlike many of his contemporaries, including Pablo Picasso, Fernand Léger, and Henri Matisse, 
who by this time had all created a prodigious number of paintings, Duchamp had deliberately limited his artistic production to just a handful of key works. In doing so, Duchamp believed that he could avoid repeating himself, which he argued had been the sad fate of so many successful painters in the modern era. The Bois Invalides can thus be seen as a self-deprecating joke, with an undertone of criticism for the excesses of his fellow artists, which allowed Duchamp to proudly proclaim that his earth was so small that he could fit all of his art objects in a small suitcase. There is also the possibility that the artist originally, in, initially intended his album as a humorous parody of the comprehensive catalogue raising of Picasso's work, the Christian Zervos began in 1932. The monumental task of documenting Picasso's work throughout his lifetime, the Spanish-born artist would live another 40 years, and the catalogue raisonné would eventually number 33 volumes, was widely publicized at the time, especially after Picasso decided to help Zervos by signing each new painting with the exact date of its completion. Long suspicious of the notion of the heroic artist genius, Duchamp was rather scornful of this endeavor, which smacked to him of rampant narcissism. In a television interview with the Museum of Modern Art's curator, James Johnson Sweeney, that aired on NBC in 1956, Duchamp explained his reasons for making a comprehensive anthology of his own works, as well as its shift from book form or album to a portable museum. And this is Duchamp. It was a new form of expression for me. Instead of, painting something, instead of painting something, the idea was to reproduce the paintings that I love so much in miniature. I didn't know how to do it. I thought of a book, but I didn't like that idea. Then I thought of the idea of a box in which all my works would be mounted like in a small museum. And here it is, in this valise. At a time when no museum would honor Duchamp with a retrospective exhibition, the artist decided, in effect, to be his own curator, organizing a self-contained traveling exhibition of his life's work that could be changed at will simply by rearranging the contents of the box. Why the artist should want to faithfully reproduce the highlights of his artistic career in miniature and pack them into a small suitcase has been the subject of great scholarly discussion ever since the first Bois and Valise appeared in 1941. Benjamin Buchler, who has perhaps offered the most convincing reading of the work today, views it as representing Duchamp's attempt to critically address the institutionalization of the avant-garde, meaning the process of acculturation by which the transgressive artistic practices of the early 20th century came to be officially validated, categorized historically and stylistically, reproduced and commodified, and consequently domesticated and defanged of their subversive intent by museums and art galleries. Duchamp's Bois Valise reconstructs this system only to parody it by self-administrating the institutional acculturation of his own work as well as its reification in the commercial art market. The museum layout, the reproduced status of the artworks, and their curatorial and pedagogical presentation, with each artwork being clearly catalogued and identified in terms of its title, date, and collection, all speak to an historical awareness of a specific reformulation of the art museum in the 1930s. Duchamp conceptualized his portable museum at the same time that André Malraux was rethinking his own, and there are numerous similarities between the two projects. After reading Walter Benjamin's seminal 1936 article on art in the age of mechanical reproduction, Malraux began to consider the promising possibilities of transforming the museum from a geographically determined collection of original art objects, traditionally organized by national schools, as in the Louvre, into a virtual display of cross-reference photographic reproductions, much like a Google image search today. This new model represented a post-national and post-architectural museum, since the images would be free-floating rather than fixed through permanent collection displays. Malraux's Museum Without Walls, as it came to be known, uprooted works of art from the historical, geographical, or temporal contexts 
and reorganized them along purely stylistic grounds. In one memorable instance, for example, he compared a photograph of an angel's head from Reims Cathedral to another of a sculpted Buddha from 4th century Gandhara. As a result, artistic identity is subsumed under a metaphysics of style. As T.J. Demos has argued, Duchamp's bottom beliefs shares Malraux's system of miniaturized reproductions that have been decontextualized from any historical context. As a mobile museum of color reproductions contained inside a traveling box, Duchamp's work is thus an idiosyncratic reenactment of Melrose's museum without walls. The major difference, however, is that Duchamp's museum stages a monographic retrospective exhibition, something that Melrose's model insistently dispenses with in favor of thematic displays that trace cross-cultural and trans-historical stylistic developments. Duchamp's willingness to reproduce his works in miniature may have stemmed from his belief that there was nothing inherently sacred about a work of art, and that the idea behind an art object was more important than the object itself. However, the obsessive attention to detail that one finds in the production of the boxes also suggests a concern to preserve the past while simultaneously keeping his alive, ideas alive for new generations of artists. The Bourdonvilliers project began in the spring of 1935, at a time when Duchamp was preparing to restore the bride strip bed by her bachelor's even, otherwise known as the large glass, which had been badly damaged following its first public exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum of Art in 1926. The work was returned to its owner, the aforementioned Catherine Dreyer, in a flatbed truck, bouncing along the rural Connecticut roads bouncing like that. <laughs> Taking it to her home in West Reading, the two enormous panes of glass shattered, and it took Dreyer another four years to summon up the courage to inform Duchamp that his magnus, magnum opus, which, which he had worked on from 1912 to 1923, was now lying, shattered in pieces. The artist decided to laboriously glue the broken shards back together, and recreate the sections that were beyond repair, which required him to revisit the handwritten notes, sketches, and diagrams that had prepared the way for the large glass. In October 1934, Duchamp published 94 of these notes in facsimile form in a limited edition box set known to posterity as the green box, due to the color of the felt-covered cardboard box that houses the notes and diagrams. The notes published in the Green Box provided an indispensable guide to the genesis, construction, and meaning of the work, which could now be understood as an allegory of frustrated desire involving the bride above and the circle of nine uniform bachelors below. They also helped Duchamp to lovingly conserve and stabilize the large glass over the course of two months during the summer of 1936, during which he worked daily on the task of carefully gathering the shattered glass fragments and fixing them back to their original position. It's a job, I tell you, he told a local journalist, but fun, like doing a jigsaw puzzle, only worse. Duchamp completed his repair of the large glass by sandwiching the entire assembly between two additional plates of glass, which he mounted in a metal frame and installed in the library of Catherine Dreyer's Connecticut home. He also took advantage of his close proximity to the work to recreate this huge painting on glass for the Bois de Police, using transparent celluloid instead of glass, which would almost certainly have broken over time due to the portable nature of the project. Upon his return to Europe in September 1936, Duchamp wrote to Dreyer that repairing the large glass had been, quote, a wonderful vacation in my past life vacation in past time instead of a new era. It is surely no coincidence that Duchamp began making preparations for the Bois Invalides in the immediate <coughs> aftermath of the publication of the Green Box Notes, and was actively sketching and making color notes for his early works during the painstaking reconstruction of the large glass. And here you see on the far side a polymer enameled. These projects share an interest in the replication and preservation of works of a fragile and ephemeral nature that might otherwise have been lost or destroyed. 
They also reflect Duchamp's thinking about the facsimile and the nature of the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, to borrow the title of Walter Benjamin's famous 1936 essay. The essay is now more traditionally translated as the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility. Both, I think, work for the argument I'm going to make. As I will argue, Duchamp's bottom for Lee's venture offers a powerful commentary on and counterpoint to Benjamin's writings about the aura of a work of art and its loss in an age of photography and film, which is, we have seen, directly inspired on Ridden Alro's notion of a museum without walls. According to Benjamin, photography and film represented a crisis for painting, which, as an object for contemplative immersion, cannot tolerate mass viewing conditions. The endless technological reproduction of works of art would inevitably destroy their authority, he argued, since the changes in human perception that necessarily happen when technology represents reality in different ways would ensure that paintings would become ubiquitous, ephemeral, and ultimately valueless. Benjamin analyzed Dadaist montage and film, which have an intentionally jarring and violent impact on the senses of the viewer that denies any form of associative thought or contemplation. However, there, there is an ambivalence in Benjamin's writings about the aura of the work of art, whose meaning is not entirely clear. On the one hand, its loss is celebrated as the end of the exclusive, reified, and highly ritualized status of an art object, which previously belonged in the privileged domain of the wealthy private cultural museum, in favor of a popular mass audience that now has unprecedented access to works of art through photography, postcards, advertising billboards, and other forms of technological reproduction. Benjamin mourns the disappearance of aesthetic experience of a unique and unrepeatable kind that he felt would be the inevitable result of the mass reproductions of paintings and other artworks in the 20th century. Duchamp, however, refused to believe that a work of art was capable of having an aura, and his rejection of painting in favor of film and photography during the Dadaist era was a direct result of his loss of faith that the kind of aesthetic contemplation and erratic sensation that Benjamin yearned for was even possible, let alone desirable. When asked why he quit painting in 1918, Duchamp responded pointedly, my attitude towards making art is that of an atheist towards religion. I would rather be shot or kill myself than paint again. It's a very emphatic statement. And of course, that has to be understood within the, the context of the senseless slaughter of the First World War, which had led to the death of his brother, the noted sculptor Raymond duchamp and numerous other friends, after, including Apollinaire, of course, after which Duchamp put down his paintbrush, claiming that it reminded him too much of a bayonet. Like Benjamin, Duchamp recognized that the art object would have a different presence in an age of mass media and mechanical reproduction, and that it would take value from something other than mimesis in the traditional sense. Duchamp thus embraced the facsimile and the copy at the very moment that Benjamin was lamenting their role in diminishing the aura of the work of art. It should be pointed out that Duchamp could have used faster reproduction techniques, such as offset lithography, to make the facsimiles of his works in the Bordeaux Belize, but chose instead to use an incredibly laborious printing technique that gave him a far superior degree of exactitude in terms of color. After obtaining black and white photographs of all of the paintings and works on paper that he wanted to reproduce in the modern police, Duchamp traveled to see each work in person, making detailed notations on their palette and paint handling. He then began making batches of color type reproductions that were printed in monochrome on large sheets of paper. Duchamp added the necessary colors to these black and white images based on his notes, as well as his memory of creating the originals. From these hand-colored reproductions, the highly skilled craftsmen who worked with Duchamp at the Pochoir studio prepared a series of watercolors that served to establish the necessary sequence of colors, and thus the number of stencils required for each work. Then, for each individual shade, a proof was painted onto zinc foil, and the parts to be colored were cut out of the proof, 
and the foil with a special knife before the colour was applied with a flat brush. As Eke Bonk has noted, it took around eight weeks to obtain a satisfactory, satisfactory image using this process. On average, each work reproduced in the Bois Valise contains about 30 individual colours, all applied by hand through stencils and then colour corrected by Duchamp, who would reject numerous proofs before reaching the exact hues. It's an incredible process. Now, it should be pointed out that pochoir was a technique that had been developed for the fashion industry in the 19th century and reached its apogee in the 1920s with Art Deco designers such as Paul Poiret and Jacques Doucet, who used pochoir for their fashion plates, advertising, and magazine illustrations. It was also particularly well suited to cubism because of the flat colors and fractured planes. Picasso had made prints with pochoir, as had Brock. And I, I haven't fully kind of delved into this enough, but I think there's some connection with the Ballet Russe. And Diaghilev was also known to have been interested in this technique. However, by the time Duchamp discovered the process in the mid-1930s, it had already begun a slow yet inexorable decline into obscurity, as the labor-intensive hand color techniques gradually became replaced by mechanized color printing processes. Unimaginable as this may seem today, the meticulous hand color pochoir process, which took Duchamp six years to complete, gave him the result he desired, namely a series of miniature facsimiles of his most important works that precisely replicated their colors. Multiple in number, yet singular in appearance, these paradoxical works transcend the facile and mechanical replication of images through their fetishistic attachment to the colors of the original. No mechanical process had yet been invented that could rival the outstanding quality of the colors in these uncanny simulacra. Yet the sheer scale of the project, for which the artist created some 23,000 pochoir reproductions, would have been impossible to have been conceived before the age of mechanical reproduction. The concept of replication and facsimile thus becomes for Duchamp a new way of thinking about the work of art. Rejecting Benjamin's notion of the importance of the novel object is based on its singular identity, its uniqueness and originality, Duchamp instead celebrates the plurality of copies available through mass reproduction as the most salient and pervasive manifestation of modernity. Duchamp delighted in the fact that the Bois Valise was not recognized as a work of art when it first appeared in the early 1940s and was even regarded as proof that he had ceased to be an artist. Holding on to the notion of the erratic original artwork, art critics had no vocabulary with which to deal with these works, which offered a profound challenge to the accepted codes and practices of art making, as they were heretofore understood. Duchamp even submitted works related to the Bois de to the 1940 International Exhibition of Surrealism in Mexico City, where they were once again ignored by the art critics. Ironically, the only person to validate these works as works of art, rather than mere reproductions, was Walter Benjamin, who noted their strange attraction in his diary in the late spring of 1937. Saw Duchamp this morning, he wrote. Same cafe on the Boulevard Saint-Germain. Showed me his painting, New Descending a Staircase, in a reduced format colored by hand, en pochoir, breathtakingly beautiful, may be mentioned, end quote. Benjamin clearly recognized that Duchamp had managed to blur the boundaries between the unique art object and the multiple in this work, whose breathtaking beauty derived from the pochoir method of applying colors through stencils, reinstated the aura into a mechanically reproduced work of art. And I'll just point out, you can probably see at the bottom in that kind of white area, there's a notary stamp. So Duchamp's father was a notary. And when Duchamp had reached the state in which he believed the pochoir resembled the original, he had it notarized. He literally had it notarized. This was an, an official work of art. And it's amazing that he showed this to Benjamin. It was not until 1941 that Duchamp began to use the term Bois-en-Valise, 
and his decision to place his works inside a leather suitcase was almost certainly informed by his personal circumstances during the Second World War. The German occupation of Paris that began in June 1940 meant that Duchamp was unable to travel freely through the occupied zone to obtain materials for his boxes, much of which came from suppliers in the south of France. I thought of a scheme, he later recalled. I had a friend, Gustave Kandel, who was a wholesale cheese merchant in Lazare, and I asked him if he could commission me to go and buy cheese for him in the unoccupied sector. This is a segue. This is Gustave Kandel. Duchamp went to school with Gustave Kandel in Rouen, and this is his mother. Uh, Duchamp painted it in 1912. It was just acquired by the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And uh, it's his Odelon Redon period. Very short lived. So short lived, it's only this one painting. <laughs> I just thought I'd show you that. Back to the quote. Kandel gave me a letter, which I took to the German authorities, and with that letter and a bribe of 1,200 francs, I got from his secretary that famous little red card called an Ausweis, which allowed me to travel by train from Paris to Marseille. I thought I had to be very careful and buy cheese, and probably give an account of my expenses when I crossed the border between the two zones. But the Germans never asked me any questions. In the newly conceived Bois and Valise, the artist's works are reproduced on a Lilliputian scale and cleverly arranged inside the box like a traveling salesman's wares, thus mirroring his own efforts to gather much-needed paper and other materials for his project, which were hidden under the cheese samples. I think Meredith should smell his papers. <laughs> In the spring of 1941, Duchamp used his travel permit as a cheese merchant to make, these, to make three trips to Marseille, where he picked up enough supplies for around 50 boxes that he planned to assemble in, in the United States. Duchamp brought them to Grenoble and shipped them as household effects with Peggy Guggenheim's art collection to New York, where he would join them in May 1942, after spending nearly a year obtaining the necessary travel permits. And there is an extremely poignant historical correspondence between the fate of Duchamp, who was able to cross Nazi checkpoints without drawing attention to his artistic identity, and that of Walter Benjamin, who escaped Paris on June 13, 1940, the day before the German arm army entered the city, after pace placing a copy of the work of art in the age of technological reproducibility in the Bibliothèque Nationale for safekeeping. Benjamin had been living in Paris as a refugee since 1933, when, endangered as a, Ger as a German Jewish intellectual, he had escaped Germany after the Nazis seized power. Benjamin arrived in Marseille in mid-September 1940, when Max Horkheimer had arranged to have an emergency exit visa waiting for him at the United States consulate. Unfortunately, Benjamin had, a, had failed to obtain a French exit visa, newly required by the collaborationist Vichy regime, which was relentlessly purging its enemies of the state at that time. After anxiously waiting for several days without being able to secure the necessary travel permits, Benjamin took a train to the countryside near the Spanish border, and from there, out of sheer desperation, decided to make the harrowing crossing through the Pyrenees Mountains with a small group of refugees and enter Spain illegally. Because of his heart condition, he could only walk for 10 minutes at a time and then stop for one. Yet he refused to let anyone help him or even carry his black leather briefcase, which contained, he said, a new manuscript that was more important than I am. After arriving in the Spanish border town of Port Bou, Benjamin was informed that he would not be admitted into the country without the outstanding French exit visa and was to be sent back the following morning to the German authorities in, in unoccupied France, in occupied France. Unwilling to accept this fate, he committed suicide in his hotel room on September the 26th, 1940. He was 48 years old. Soon afterwards, his leather briefcase was handed over to a court in Figueres, 
although the contents, including the new manuscript, later went missing and have never been recovered. So I hope that you, like me, will pause for a moment this evening as you look at Duchamp's own travelling box in the Kemper Museum galleries, obsessively filled with reproductions of his life's work, and think of Benjamin's empty leather briefcase and the tragic loss of one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. To conclude then, we have seen how Duchamp's concept of the portable museum intersects with and responds to Walter Benjamin's ideas about the changing status of art in an age of mass reproduction, as well as André Malraux's thoughts about art as an assembly of meaning informed by different voices across time and place. Whether by coincidence or design, Duchamp, Benjamin, and Malraux, all of whom were working in Paris in the mid-1930s, were simultaneously exploring the reproduction, transformation, and distribution of images at a time when film, media, and technology were transforming the city in which they lived. Since Duchamp's own death in October 1968, the meaning and significance of the Bois within the artist's oeuvre has increased considerably. It is no longer regarded as a mere collection of reproductions, having little more than documentary or nostalgic value, but rather as a unique and important work of art in its own right. Moreover, it has become increasingly apparent that Duchamp's use of replication and appropriation to undercut the accepted notion of originality and authenticity was hugely important to subsequent generations of artists. And I'll just show you here the Fluxus group, which made their own Duchamp-inspired boxes and suitcases known as Flux Kits in the 1960s. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. No such thing as a bad question, only a bad answer. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. That was extremely interesting, and, and I learned something about pochoir that I didn't know. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, it was used in the 40s and the 50s for deluxe albums of reproductions of paintings. Yes. And it became notorious because it beautified the original works of art. It smoothed out problems. It made for seamless transitions from one bit of a painting to another. And so when Benjamin is saying, this is very beautiful, what, what do you think he was actually responding to? Well, I think Pochoir was always associated with, with luxury. I mean, as I said, I, I think the fashion industry latches onto it very quickly because it, it was very well designed for fashion plates and wallpaper. And so these, these high-end luxury magazines that people like Doucet and Poiret were, were, were selling, Pochoir was just designed for it. And you're right, it, it, it kind of moves more into high-end book illustration afterwards. So I think Benjamin was looking at the ravishing colors. Um, I don't, the, to me, the, the interesting thing is the, is the phrase maybe mention. So does that mean Having seen it, he might go back to the work of art in the age of mechanical technological reproducibility and, and rethink some of his statements. I don't know. Um, but I will say, uh, I'll get to the, to the image, it is ravishingly beautiful. When, when, you, when you hold uh, this in your hands, I mean, it's, it, it, there's something that I think what Duchamp is doing is pushing printing into a state where you're, you're beginning to have originals again. And that was really something that I think gave Benjamin pause. Um, I'm still trying to figure out, uh, an important figure in this is Jacques Villon, Duchamp's brother, who was a printmaker. Duchamp knew a lot about printmaking. He had escaped military service by uh, being apprenticed to his grandfather, who was a printmaker. And so he, he but he wouldn't have known about Pochoir. I think his brother taught him that. And so what I'm hoping is that the family's archives have something in there that can unlock this, because it is rather remarkable how quickly Duchamp latches onto it, and it's right in that mid-30s moment. 
Sabine? I just have one comment. I don't know, maybe it's completely off, but there is this entire passage in the reproducibility essay where Benjamin talks about uh, the cameraman. Remember and how the cameraman basically cuts body pieces and uh, cuts through the narrative, but also, and so I'm, I'm not sure, but Benjamin obviously was interested, A, in motion, B, he was interested in film, and he was interested in the fragmentation of the human body in film. And yeah. so I'm just wondering in which ways that not also relate yeah. to that image. And which, which that is, comment really beautiful because he was believing, you know, in the revolutionary um, quality of, of, of film, you know, in, 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 in contrast. That's right. So and I was just thinking if that couldn't. I, th I think <laughs> it's a great point because also um, the new descending obviously was looking at Marais, Mybridge. Yeah. It, it has a cinematic quality to it. Um, I mean, what's, what's kind of terrible is that Benjamin doesn't live and Duchamp does live. And that was one of the things I was trying to get at, is, is how history is defined. Because Duchamp goes on, a lot of, of what came out in, in my paper is really deep archival research of the kind that had Benjamin lived, we might have a bigger archive to know uh, about his writings of the 30s, and we just don't. But the cameraman thing, I'm, I'm going to look at that again. Yes? The other thing, Michael, is, is that uh, for Schwarz, something we find in albums that whose pages can be turned. So so the thing that Benjamin might have been responding to was touching this reproduction. It, yeah. it seems to me that that uh, all of Duchamp's ready-mades were easily touchable because they were the same as the mass of public objects, common objects, that uh, uh, became sanctified only through declaration. But in the Pequot, everything was associated with qualities of scrutiny, of readership, of page turning. I, I think this question of touch is not addressed by Benjamin, yeah. but it might have been something Benjamin felt. Well, also, something that, that, that relates to that is that Duchamp actually signs off on this and notarizes it in December of 1937. So what Benjamin was really looking at was a proof, and it was a proof that Duchamp rejected, because that that ends up being the proof he accepts. And I find it lovely that Duchamp is in the boulevard Saint-Germain sipping coffee at a cafe and saying, no, nope, try again. <laughs> I mean, there's something amazing about that. And, and Ben is like, this is beautiful. So, um, and a lot of it, you know, is fantasy. I mean, it's one diary entry. And if you were to look at the whole diary, you, 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 it, it would sort of paint a picture of Paris. Did Duchamp know Benjamin well? No, but they, they clearly knew each other well enough for Duchamp to show him this in a cafe, which I, I think is rather staggering, given the connections that I've made. Yes. I like the image in the cafe also, uh, but the notarization of the rejection makes it legal. Mm. And that's, you know, the bon attiré, which was traditional, is actually being made into a legal document. That's correct. And that's very um, of a piece with Duchamp's legalistic thinking. That's very true. He was the son of a notary. He, he, <laughs> this, this was, I mean, notarized. I mean, it's, it's an official document. This is it. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of strange because it is part of that legalized thing, but then he's also so associated with Dada and breaking the rules. And that's why we love him. We love him in his contradictions. Yes. In a sort of different direction, I was thinking about the portability of the release, and then I was thinking about um, Merce Cunningham's walk around time, where uh, these sort of plastic blow ups of, <clears throat> I think it's the bride, uh, the bridegroom piece, uh, the dancers move around the stage and sometimes disappear behind them, and because of the senior cage connection, which I hadn't known about, I started thinking about maybe this is kind of a, of a, um, a pun yeah. <laughs> that the walk around time, you know, the, the pieces themselves being carried around on the on the release itself. That's right. Well that the piece you're describing is it's walk around time and so there's they're basically plastic cubes that make up the large glass and the dancers carry them. 
And I mean, it's directly inspired by this. And Cage has this wonderful um, play on words about Marcel, let me carry your baggage. I mean, remember, it, it, you know, so I didn't fully tell you the, the, the story. So Duchamp basically lets the, the Pochoirs go to New York on that boat with Peggy Guggenheim's collection. Peggy Guggenheim's collection is an art collection. His are just labeled as household effects, but they make it and he reunites with it. And Xenia Cage is living, John Cage and Xenia Cage are living in Peggy Guggenheim's townhouse. So that's when Duchamp, ever the kind of lazy bugger, says, oh, you want to help me with this? So, and we don't, we just don't know the, the date of this. If it's in the if it's in the forty two realm, Xenia Cage had, had a, a role to play in this. If it's more like 47, 48, it's probably Cornell. Um, I looked at it with Meredith. There's really no there's no inscription. There's nothing really to, to suggest it could be fifty four. Um, but I love that 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 whole connection. I mean, Cage spending time with Duchamp in forty two. And hearing about chance, I mean, it just changed his life. Absolutely changed his life. Time for one more question. Yes. Um, I find one thing, it's, I'm sort of my introduction to Duchamp was 50 years ago and really changed my direction into the fine arts. And I, when I heard about this talk, I was quite interested in it to see how that work is still influencing and being looked at to this day. And I know quite a few young artists you know, just coming out now, who are still being inspired and, and creating from the ideas that came out of things like the the box and his other works and his use of chance. Mm. That's very true. I mean, I could have showed you there's a an artist called Marcel Zama who's done a series of suitcases directly inspired by them. But also, you know, I think less obvious ways. I mean, I, I always think of. Bob Gober's piece, where you look down in the floor and you, and you see a, a standing man holding a child. Do you know that piece? It was mm -hmm. done for Mocha. If you look at what you're looking into, it really is a suitcase. You're looking into a suitcase and it's what's down below. So, I mean, it really did have this amazing afterlife. And uh, it was interesting to read the, the critics because they, they really had no language to mm -hmm. talk about. What is this? You know, is it an album of prints? You know, they really struggle. And that's, I think, when Duchamp knew he had a good work. Yeah. Because if, <laughs> because if no one can write about it. Right. I mean, it, the Bois de Valise is shown very prominently in the uh, Surrealist Exhibition in Mexico City. You see it in the photographs. And we knew, we know that Frida Kahlo and Duchamp had a friendship, and so she made sure it was shown. It's not in any review, any review anyone's found. And so it just was silence, which he loved. Well, thank you for listening, and enjoy the work. It's a great addition to the Kemper Collection. Thank you.